All right. So I'm just going to start us out by praying real quick, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for another beautiful day, Lord. I just pray just all the words coming out of my mouth, Lord. I just pray this is not glorifying for me, Lord. It's glorifying for you. I just want to pray. We just have a good time, Lord, and just get something out of the word. And Lord, I love you. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So I'm Kyle. I know lots of you know me. And I am now about to turn 18 years old. I go to the high school, and I've been going to this church for about four and a half years now. And I just want to start by asking a weird question. Who in all has been to a store? I'm so sorry you've never been in a store. <laughs> so just imagine you're going to a store. You have a reason to go to the store, obviously. So you probably brought your money or your mom's just taking you because she's trying to feed you. You're walking into the store. You get something, okay? Where do you bring it? You bring it to the cash register. And then when you go to buy it, it's officially yours. You're walking out the door. It's all yours. And you have bought it with a price, so now you own it. Whether you eat it or not, you still own it. And so it just it gives a good image of how God has paid the price on the cross and shed the blood for us, for our sins, and our literally just taking the place for us. So he shed the blood and just taking all our sins. So, so at this point, you are, he, God is in ownership of us. So we should be thankful because we could have been dying on that cross because we deserve the death because he paid the price for us. So Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the holy water and the holy spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to do to the end of the age. So basically, God has commanded us to be on mission, telling everyone about God, because what good news God is. Amen. <laughs> and God shows us to witness in his name to the people. So he uses us to point to in the direction of him and tell others about the good news about Jesus. So kind of in your life, you have two choices. You living in approval of God, or you can live in approval of man, which I prefer God because he's eternal and all. But if you give, put your approval in man, they're just going to let you down. God's very trustworthy. <laughs> so, have you ever heard that sharing the gospel is very important and just, it should be like recited every single day? Okay. So who's ever been scared about sharing the gospel? Because I know I have, yeah, me. So obviously, I'm the same way. But the Bible says about sharing the gospel is good, and it's good, and it's good. And you should not be scared because in no way are they supposed to look at you and say, wow, you're an awesome person. I'm proud of you. I want to be around you more because you're so awesome and perfect. But no, sharing the gospel is supposed to be for God. So we shouldn't be scared to share the gospel because it's not how they view us. It's how... We talk to them and see how they view God. We don't save the people. They choose to let Jesus come in their life, and God chooses to save them. So we have no, there shouldn't be any reason why we should be scared. Once again, I still get scared, no worries. So kind of like we should just keep sowing and sowing, sowing the, the parable of the sower. And so maybe one day there will be a sprout, and God will save them because they put and want God in their heart. So we should not be scared of that. Matthew 5.10, like I kind of said, was blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom in heaven. So it's saying it's going to happen because if they don't want to hear God, they're not going to want to hear God. So they could like shut you down or just be rude or just walk away and throw a, throw a hand or something. <laughs> you never know. So. Oh, another good verse is 1 Peter 4.14. If you are insulted in the name of Christ, you are blessed because of, the, because of the spirit and glory, the spirit of glory and of God resists upon you, rests upon you. Sorry. <laughs> so I just want to encourage all of you, just don't be scared because I know we're all in school. So you know there's brokenness. There's brokenness all around us. So there's plenty of room and plenty of time because... Who can honestly say they stay on their work throughout the whole class? There might be a few of you, but you talk a lot in class. It could be 
small talk, then you can eventually just lead it right into God and just have a good day because you're going to feel like good because you're sitting there glorifying God. So it can be within class, at sports, when you're hanging out with a friend, or just we can even practice within each other at church or just outside because if people see that, that's awesome. So let your light shine for others so they might see your good works, so they might glorify your Father who's in heaven. I might have butchered that. I don't know. <laughs> so Matthew 5, 44, but it's... But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So going back to the persecution, pray for them. Because, I mean, that's good. I mean, you're sitting there praying for the same guy that just persecuted you. Instead of looking at them saying how, wow, they just made me feel so bad. But no, you did that for God. And God says, the glory is for you because you got persecuted in righteousness' sake. So it's good because we should not feel the pain for how they put evil upon you because you've got God in your heart. And I basically just wanted to encourage you, so I guess that's good. That was probably me. I'm sorry. Great job, Kyle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And again, um, this is something that we want for all of you guys to do, to be able to do. Share. Um, here during youth group and like Kyle said, like we've been commanded to share out in this world, in the community where God has, has placed us. So we've been talking about uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We've been walking through um, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, one thing I noticed when we were in Honduras, when you went around other people that didn't speak your language, Something happened with your volume. Do you guys remember? If you were in Honduras, and you're trying to get somebody to understand you, <clears throat> what'd you do? You like talk louder, right? <laughs> Hello, hola, my name, Chris, right? Like it's, but, but what's the issue? Like, have you ever experienced that? Like you, you're somebody, either you yourself or someone else, they're speaking to somebody of a different language, whether that was Spanish whether it was Chinese, fill in the blank, a different language, and all of a sudden, like, their volume just gets, like, way up here. Has anybody ever experienced that? Yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, that was something that, that, that we saw there in Honduras, right? If you, especially if you didn't speak Spanish. Um, it's like we, we spoke louder. <laughs> like, maybe that would help. But what's the issue? What's the problem? Yeah, we don't speak their language. It's, it, it's not that they can't hear <laughs> right? But there's a language difference. And so it doesn't matter how loud we, we speak English. If they don't understand and they don't know English, they're not going to comprehend. They're not going to, to get it. And today, I wanted to open up with that picture because I believe it's, it's something that we see in the scriptures here. We're going to see in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to see that, that, that it's not an issue of speaking louder right? But it's, it's making sure that we're speaking the correct language. Let's pray. Father God, as we read your word, Lord, would your word come to life in our hearts and in our minds and in our very soul to transform us from the inside out? Your word, God, you are life. You are the word of God. And we want to hear from you and not from man. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 6, 7 says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words, right? There, there, was, a, there was an issue here. The Gentiles, right, were heaping up many words so that God would hear them. It's, it's kind of like that, that same picture. If I speak loud enough, if I speak enough words, and, and I use big words and wordy words, that they're going to somehow reach God because I'm speaking these big words and I'm speaking a lot of them or I'm speaking very loudly. So now God should hear my prayers. And even this was something that, that the religious leaders and the Pharisees, they would say and speak these great big prayers so that others would be like, wow, they're awesome. They must be really close to God, and God must really be hearing their prayers. But there was an issue there. And, and if you remember last week, we talked about a word, a word hypocrisy or hypocrites. And when we saw some different uh, ways that 
individuals and some, some red flags that we have to be uh, uh, careful of, the way that we give, the way that we, we serve, the, our generosity, and, and here even our prayers. And we're coming back to this one because I believe this is so important for the life of a believer to really understand our communication with the Father, our communication with God. And we want, we, we've got to get that right. It, it's one of the foundational things in our lives. And it's one of the things that just transforms our relationship with God and really can really do a great work in our lives. And we have to be careful, though, how we pray. And we see here, right, that Jesus was warning them. If we continue in, into, into verse 8, so I'm going to read 7 again, and let's go into 8. And it says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Verse 9, Jesus says, pray like this, our father in heaven. Now I'm going to stop there because verse 9 is, is huge. Jesus says, pray like this, our father. Right there, our father that is, that is the key, right? That, that's the beginning of everything. Our Father, that it must be out of a personal relationship with God. Our prayer, our prayers, the key to our prayers is our relationship with God, is, is the right position and posture before God. John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to all who have received him, speaking of Jesus, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, it is only through a relationship with Jesus Christ that we have access to the very throne room of God the Father. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that makes a way for us to, to enter the very presence of God and to beckon, to, to cling to his feet, to his robe, to cling to him. Now, some of you are like, yeah, I, heard, I saw y'all laughing at my glasses, right? You're like, what is he doing, Right? So these glasses coming up here, it, 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 there's a film, there's a shade, right? It, it blocks out the, these, these lights, right? And everything is filtered, and now I see everything in a darker shade than any of y'all see because I'm wearing these glasses, right? And it's the same way when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a life that is surrendered to Jesus Christ. There's a filter, there, there, there is a difference in the way that we see there, there's a difference in our life. Our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our prayers are postured in a beautiful way. It's out of an intimate relationship. We are no longer just individuals, just God's creation, but God's children. And it's an intimate relationship that we have with the Father. And God is a good, good Father. We see that throughout Scripture. And so no matter what background, some of y'all have a background where your father has failed you in many different ways. And we can relate to that even with a good father. They still fail us. They still, they still you know, maybe have spanked us out of anger or they had got short-tempered or they forgot a promise that they were going to keep or a date or whatever, fill in the blank. But we have a good, 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 perfect heavenly father. And the only way that we can call out to him as our father in that intimate way, Abba, Daddy, Father, the only way that we can call out to God the Father is through relationship with God the Son. And that is the key. That is, that, that is the first and foremost. We must have that right. So that way, as we are, are going through life, as we're looking, as we're praying, it's through a certain lens now. 
the lens of, of a relationship with Jesus Christ, a lens that is filtered through the cross of Jesus Christ, a lens that, that is filtered through the gospel and the truth and the scriptures of Jesus Christ. And that is key and foundational. That's where it starts. For us to properly learn how to pray, right? We must be surrendered. We must have, have submitted, surrendered our life to God the Father. We must understand our salvation. And, and, and we must understand where we stand. We must know of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And out of, of that relationship and out of that posture and through that lens, Jesus tells us how to pray. He gives us some practical ways of how to pray to God, of, of how, how our lives and our prayers should be filtered. And so it says, he continues, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now that's a big word. We don't really use that a lot, hallowed. Anybody use that on a normal day? Yeah, me either, <laughs> right? Hallowed be thy name. But hallowed, it, it, it's this picture of, of being holy, 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 and, and set apart. Unlike anyone else, God is holy, holy, holy. He is, he is set apart, and he is deserving of all honor and praise, of our reverence, of, of our best, that we should approach him, right, not flippantly, we shouldn't just be like, you know, just like, hey, bro, hey, homeboy, Jesus is my homeboy. No, Jesus is Lord. He is King. He is God Almighty. He is the creator and the sustainer. And so there is a part. Yes, God, we see in scripture that, that it says that he calls us friend, right? His children. And he does. He does care and he desires to tenderly, tenderly and affectionately and lovely and gracefully and patiently care for his children. He, he is that. But we, we must also have a reverence and a fear of his holiness, of his power, of his majesty and his might. And we see that, that Christ is explaining that to the disciples and explaining that to us. When we pray, we are praying out of a, a position, out of a posture as a, of a child and an understanding of his majesty and how big and grand and glorious he is. But yet, that, remember, that's coupled with how personal and intimate he is as a father, as our daddy, as our good, good father. And so it's, it's a beautiful picture of both ends of the spectrum. He is big and, and, and majestic, but yet he is personal and intimate and so thoughtful that he knows every fiber of your being and every hair on top of your head is numbered and known by God. That is amazing and that is beautiful. But hallowed be his name, holy and, and deserving of all honor and worship and glory. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says it this way. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks of you the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Right? That we regard in our heart Understanding how to pray, right, is understanding that we surrender these things to God and that we sur are surrendered to him as holy and majestic and powerful, that we look to God and we understand, hallowed be your name, holy are you, Lord, and worthy of our time, worthy of our efforts, worthy of us being down on bended knee, worthy of us coming to him and spending time with him. Verse 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, right now from just these verses that we have, have been going through, we see um, your father who knows 
what you need in verse 8, right? Ask of, of him. Pray this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Central to this prayer and to what Christ is teaching, what Jesus is teaching us, what Jesus is teaching his disciples, center, central to our prayers is who? God. How often is it, God, I have this going on and I, I've got this big test and, and I'm dating this one and I'm talking to this girl and she's really cute and if you just like help me with that, right? And I've got this going and mom and dad and me, 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 Right? How often are our prayers censored around us, right? It's taken me a long time. Remember, I was never discipled at an at a early age. At the age of 19 is when I surrendered my life to Christ. But, but I was encouraged to buy a Bible and then, you know, read the Bible. <laughs> and so I, I wasn't taught these things of how to pray, but Christ, and through the graciousness of God and, and being able to be in different roles and being around different men and women in my Christian walk, learning more and more, but God is still continuing to teach me how to pray. There are still times where I'm like, no, I don't. Like, like there's this wrestling, right, at times where it's like, I, I don't want to pray. That, that's awkward. They don't want me to pray. Why, why should I pray for them? Like, but we do it out of obedience. But here we see, Right? Central to our prayers is who? Is who? God. Central to our prayers is God. Holy are you, God. Majestic, intimate, and personal. So good to us that you don't leave us orphaned and abandoned, but you've adopted us by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we get to call you Father. It's how personal, but how majestic as we see how great and grand and big are you and holy, and worthy of our time and praise, but yet, God, not my will, not my kingdom come. We look around, and we see the desperate need for the move of God in families, in community, in our school, and around this world, and that's what he's saying. Beckon for the, for the grace of God. Beckon for, for the Holy Spirit to fall upon this place. Beckon and call for God to do a move and for his kingdom to come. Right? What we're seeing right now is not the kingdom of God at hand. Right? We, see, we see the darkness and the sinfulness and the brokenness of humanity, of sin, of a fallen and broken world. And he's saying, beckon God for the gospel to go, for his will to be done, for his kingdom to come, for people to see glimpses of the goodness of God in your school, on the football field, in the locker room, in the band room, in social studies, in science, in math, and in your homes and in your neighborhoods. Beckon and call and pray out to God. God, move. Show them your goodness. Let them taste of your grace and your mercy and your salvation. And transformation happens, but it's not about our will being done, right? And he says that, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. And we, we keep on talking about this, this word surrenderance. We've been talking about it, it seems like, for months, and we have been. But the life of a Jesus follower is someone who has surrendered their life to Christ. And our prayer life is the same thing, that we, we, we pray with a heart of surrenderance. Not my will be done, Lord. Yours. Not my kingdom. I'm not trying to build my kingdom here, but God, let them see your kingdom. Let them see your gospel, your, what, the, the, your joy, your peace, your goodness, your salvation. And so we see here, central to our prayers should be God. They should be God and centered around God, filtered through the cross, filtered through the word, right? And central is Christ. And then we see here in verse 11 that God is the source of, of all good things. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our de debtors. We see that, that all good things come, come from, from God in James 1:17. Let's flip over to there and, and read. 
It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, which whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. That God is the giver of all good things. And then another beautiful thing that is said in there, that he doesn't change. He is our only constant in life. And so what more, right? What, what better th- thing, who better to be central to our lives, to be our prayer lives than the one who is unchanging, who is immutable, who is constant, but yet God, right? Only God does, is deserving of that. And what better and for our lives, for, 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 a, for a compass, right? For, for direction in life, who better than the one who is unchanging, That's why we can come to him. That's why we can surrender our lives to him. That's why we can surrender our our thrones or our plans or our future, our our, our marriage, our dating life, our sex life, our entertainment life, our social life. That's why we can surrender all those things, our finances, our jobs, our future. We can surrender all those things to him because he is faithful. He is unchanging. And that he will never leave and he'll never forsake you. And he has designed everything to work in a beautiful way. And as creator, and as he is, he is majestic and grand, right? He has designed and he's let it be made known to each and every one of us how this works out perfectly and how it works best. We've got it, you know, a lot of times we have that all messed up where we think God's trying to take all these things from me, right? My, my friends are doing this and they're doing that and this one's with this person and that person and they're, they're, they're rising to the top and they're succeeding and they're getting this promotion and, and we think that it's, that man, God's keeping all these things from me but yet, yet he has so much for you. Why do your small group leaders so passionately point you to Christ? Why, why do we, why do I, why do we share our, 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 our struggles? Why do we share our failures with you? Because we've tried it the way the world says to do it, and we failed. And it's failed us. And there's scars, and there's pain, and there's suffering that have come into marriages, and into parenting, and into families, and into relationships, and into work. And we want you to know there's a better way. And you don't have to go through those same things that we've been through. And it's all here in the word of God, in the design of God, how we do relationships and how, and it is, this is monumental for us to understand. It is through a postured heart of prayer and dependence and desperation for God to do a work in our lives. For us to posture, to surrender to him and understand that he is central, that his plans are central, and they are best. They are best. And when we understand that all good things come from God, that should also change our heart to a heart of gratitude. That we understand, man, God, you are so good to me. And when we see, when we remember where we've been and what God has done for us and where we are now, We can continue to have hearts of gratitude as we remember our daily bread, the very physical things that we need. God gives them to us. He supplies those things to us. And not only that, but yet the spiritual things. When we are yet enemies, sinful by nature, right? Sinners actively working against God, yet he saved us. And he extended his grace and his forgiveness. And he has forgiven us of our debt. Like Kyle was talking about. We've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been bought. You have been purchased. And there's no returns. <laughs> he ain't going to go back to return you. He's going to keep you. And you are his. This is a beautiful picture of what that looks like. First, we are, we, are, we are enslaved, enslaved, handcuffed to the ways of this world and to, to sin and to, to, to our sin nature and to, 
to the ways of this world and to sin. And yet what, when, when Christ saves us, he, ta- he removes those shackles. He frees you from your sin and the debt and the death that you are deserving of. And then he shackles them and he chains them to himself and says, you're mine. And he holds the key. And so you have so much to be thankful for as he has paid your debt, as he has given an extended grace and forgiveness, and he extends life and life everlasting in Christ Jesus. It goes back to that very beginning. Our Father, Abba, Daddy, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And so we see God is the source of our bread of life, of the forgiveness of life itself. Verse 13, it says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He is our strength. There is is evil all around us. Amen? Amen. You guys are back in school. You see it. There is evil all around y'all in the bathrooms, in the hallways, in the locker rooms, and everywhere in between. And then you go home and you scroll through social media. You do probably do that during school sometimes. I'm not telling anybody, right? But, and you see the evil all around, right? As you scroll, the evil is all around us. But we see here that Christ says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, what it's not saying is that God is not the one who is tempting us. It's not a prayer for that, saying, God, don't tempt us, right? Because he is not the one who tempts. We read that again in James 1, 13 through 14. It says, let, us, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. But what Christ is telling us, what, the, what, what these scriptures are telling us is that we call out to him to protect us from those things. Guard our heart and our mind, right? To, for our minds to be filled with the things of the Lord, of, of life, of God and godliness. That we are, we are calling out to him because we know this battle is spiritual, right, that we are, are facing. We know that we don't just wrestle against flesh and blood, but more importantly and mostly we wrestle against, right, the rulers in the darkness and the principalities and these evil forces of this present darkness. We, against one, our own sinful desires and our own sin nature and Satan and the demons in this world, right? We are wrestling against many evils, our own sin nature, this world, and Satan himself. And so we call out to God to protect us, to guard us, right? To lead us away from those things and into his presence. <clears throat> and then we continue to go on and it says, for if we forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Again, we go back to that beginning. We go back to the glasses. We go back to our heart, our, our lives postured. Are they, are we surrendered? Have we surrendered our lives to Christ? And through the blood of Jesus Christ and relationship with Christ, are we in a relationship with God the Father? Have, has there been a day where you've truly surrendered your life to Christ? And if there has, you know, we forgive others not because they are deserving of it, right? Because it brings glory to God. And because we were forgiven when we were undeserving. And we are undeserving of the forgiveness of God. And because we love and have tasted and have experienced the goodness of God and his gospel and his salvation, his grace, we extend that forgiveness. And I believe the, the warning is that if, if we are, 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 are going around and we're miserable and, and, and we are unforgiving and we are, we are hateful and we are hurtful, those are flags and warnings of a heart that is not surrendered to God. 
if we are not going to love, if we are not going to forgive, right? It says that the Father will not forgive us of our trespasses. And so has there been a day, has there, was there a point in your life that you've surrendered your life to Christ? wholeheartedly surrendered all to him, trusting and believing in Jesus Christ as Lord. If there has, you have access to God the Father, the throne room of God the Father, to his majesty and his power and his goodness. And you cry out to him often and always out of reverence and love and awe of his goodness. And may your prayers be transformed by the word of God and the understanding of God's word. Central to your prayers is, God, your will be done. God, make me into fishers of men. Make me into the man or the woman you have called me to be so that I can, I can share the goodness of your gospel to others. And then I, can, I could be the right spouse to that individual that you have, have, have called me to, to marry. And I can be the mother and the father that you've called me to be. That I could be the best employer, student, ball player, band player, fill in the blank that you've called me to be. But if there's never been a day, Scripture says today is the day of salvation. And so I want to challenge you to talk to your small group leader and say, I don't, I don't know this Jesus. I've never surrendered my life to Christ. And they can help lead you through the scriptures, through the word of God, of what it looks like to surrender your life to Christ, to have the very access that has been granted through the blood of Christ to God the Father. And I want to challenge each and every one of you as we go into small group time, right, for your heart, for your prayer life to be stirred into new ways, to pray even when you don't feel like it and pray when you do feel like it because he is worthy. And just see how God continues to transform your life to bless not just you but others around you when you are obedient to call out to God the Father, understanding of who he is and what he can do. And who knows, God may just show up in a great way. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. God, as we go into small group time, I just pray that you would lead conversations. God, that you would guide us. God, that you would uh, give a freedom for others to speak boldly and honestly and openly. And God, that you would do a great work in the lives of each and every young man and young woman and small group leader. God, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.